sometimes you need a wake-up call. In my case, it was an actual wake-up call. I woke up one morning to the sound of my phone ringing. It was 7 a.m. on a Friday morning in May of 2014. I was living in Nairobi at the time, and my startup, Amani Institute, was just two years old. I picked up the phone. It was our office assistant, and she was calling to say, I can't get in to clean the office this morning. There seems to be some kind of police action happening on your building. That sounded bizarre. We had no idea what she meant. So we got on Twitter, and we were able to make out that there was, had been some kind of armed burglary, and the police were engaged in a shootout with the robbers. In about two hours, I was going to have my class of 22 fellows from around the world show up for a full day of class. So we had to do something right away. I jumped out of bed and called up a co-working space, quite similar to this one, that we knew. And I said, hey, it's an emergency. Our building is under attack, and we have a full day of class. We need your help. And they said, sure. We can give you our conference room for free for the day. Come on over. Very generous of them. So what we did then was we got on our WhatsApp group, and we uh, sent a message to all the class saying, under no circumstances, go to the office today. Class has been shifted to Nairobi Garage. Please go there. And then we, you know how you sort of see if people have read it? We then followed up with individual calls to make sure everyone knew not to go to the office. And so by around 9.25 or so, only about 25 minutes late, we were underway with class, business as usual. For those of you who don't know what we do, Amani Institute is an organization that deals with education and training. We work all around the world and we run a number of global programs. Generally, our focus is to help people build the skills they need to have the careers that they want. What we are most known for, these 18 people Arjun just mentioned, is our fellowship program that is open to people from all around the world, but takes place in Nairobi. Today it also takes place in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and here in Bangalore. And what happened then is that you also got to know a little bit about the context of Kenya in 2014. It was an interesting time. Between April and June of that year, there had been a number of terrorist attacks and bomb blasts in markets, in bus stations, in shopping malls, and this was something that we were all sort of nervous about, right? It was, the atmosphere was a bit tense, and so um, several people were starting to wonder what it is that they're going to do. Now, the reason that this was happening, we all knew. Uh, it was mostly being done by Somali terrorists who were carrying out this campaign because Kenya had invaded Somalia and was still fighting there. But it was a tense and scary time. And several organizations decided to leave the country. Uh, the United States Peace Corps suspended operations in Kenya. A couple of large foreign church groups left the country. And some of my friends, including a woman I was starting to date, also had to leave because her organization left. Another close friend of mine said that he could not go to one of his best friend's wedding because he would lose his job if his organization found out that he was going to Kenya. Not the best time to run a global education program, but this was the context in which this was happening. And so what happened next was that about a few hours, uh, few hours later, we received a call from the building and management, and they said, the coast is clear, the police have got the bad guys, it's safe to come back now. So around that time, I had a colleague called Peter. Peter wanted to go back to the office for three reasons. First, he had been recently married and he had bought his wife an iPad as a surprise gift. Second, the iPad was in the office. The second, some of us also had our passports in the office. And third, we had to get some of the training materials that we needed because we weren't expecting not to be able to access the office all day. And oftentimes, attacks like this are followed by looting. And so we wanted to make sure we didn't lose all our stuff. So Peter went back to the office. 
And about an hour later, I got a call from him. Are you on your way back, Peter? I said. And he said, no. Apparently, there are still some robbers in the building. And the police are yelling and whistling, telling us to stay behind locked doors. These guys are all heavily armed, by the way. So suddenly, Peter is stuck in the office. And I have an employee of mine stuck in an office where there's a gunfight going on. So I left the co-working space and I rushed over to our office, uh, which is about 10 minutes away by cab. And I found another group of people had gathered there, friends and family members of other people who were now stuck in the building. And everyone was nervous and scared. And so this building had a, had a really high compound wall. And so now the police are yelling at us to stay behind the wall so that if there's bullets start to fly, we don't get caught in the crossfire. And now I'm hiding behind this wall, thinking about my colleague whose life is in danger. And Peter later told me that all he could think about was his wife, because he'd been just married. And he could feel his life flashing before his eyes. A few minutes later, it was over. The police did their thing, which means in Kenya that there's no arrests, but the problem is solved another way. And uh, sure enough, a few minutes later and a few gunshots later, uh, I started to see bodies being moved out of the building, put into a police van, and being driven away. And Peter came out, and he was fine. A bit shaken up, but he was OK. And so we went back to the co-working space and continued with our day. But that night, we had to process what had just happened, right? Um, we knew that. This was happening in a certain context, and we had been avoiding malls and uh, markets and so on. But we also knew that this what time it wasn't terrorism. This was regular crime, an armed robbery on a building that we happened to be in, but they were targeting a rich company that had nothing to do with us. But yet, this time it was different. This time they had hit home, right? Our office where we spend every single day. This time it felt personal. We had to decide what we were going to do. So we held an emergency meeting that night. My co-founder, um, one of our advisors, and the faculty member who had flown in from the US. And um, we had to answer this question. Should we stay or should we go? Right? We didn't want to meet in the office, so we met at this dark, sort of dingy bar. I still remember it was a dingy wine bar in a shopping mall. And uh, we had already been facing some pressure and some questions from people who uh, we're all asking us, this was our board members, our partners, parents of some of our students, and they were all asking us, is Kenya safe? Should we be there at all? We talked about this for a long time. And in the end, what we felt was that uh, we decided to stay, right? So late into the night, the staff had gone home and left us there sitting in the bar, uh, weighing pros and cons late into the night. And we were deciding to stay. Because the reason we set up in Kenya, the reason we didn't set up in Washington or New York or London or Singapore was because there are problems here. And because, and this is why I love emerging markets much more than rich countries, yes, there are problems on one hand, but there's also possibility and progress. And you can see change happening. But this didn't, uh, this didn't necessarily come easy. When we decided to stay, we also had to think about everyone else, our students as well, our fellows. And so what we, what we felt was that um, we needed to set an example, right? Um, because I truly believe that the future is being written in emerging markets. And that as an organization working in social innovation, it's really important to be where innovative things happen, to be on the front lines. And Kenya is one of the most innovative cities on the planet. So you may know that uh, mobile money uh, the technology of Paytm was originated in Kenya. Um, Crowdsourced mapping, which is common in so many apps today, originated in Kenya. So Nairobi is not just this beautiful and dynamic city with better weather than even Bangalore, believe it or not. It's also a city that has changed the world. I lived there for five and a half years, and I loved it. And while I'm happy being back in Bangalore, where I grew up, I still miss Kenya. And so we decided to stay, but we also said that Safety is a personal decision everybody should take for themselves. So if any of our fellows wanted to leave, we wouldn't uh, prevent them from leaving. We'd even refund their fees. 
but we wouldn't let them graduate. Because in order to get the learning that we were offering, you had to be where the problems were and be where the actions were. That's what our values said. This led to some problems for us. Our university partner at the time, which was for a small organization, a key source of our credibility, canceled the partnership. We lost a number of paying students because of that. Um, and we even canceled the whole program. That faculty member who was teaching that class has never come back to teach for us again. And one of our fellows was so angry that we didn't let her do the program online and graduate. She still doesn't talk to us to this day. But so we decided to stay. But one thing I have to say here is that the rest of the class, so this one fellow wanted to leave, but there were 21 other fellows. Aditi here was one of them. And they said, of course, we're going to stay. And so their courage and their commitment was so inspiring to me. And it was one of the reasons I knew we were making the right decision. So we went, uh, you know, we put our heads down, went back to work. And 2014 was a tough year. And then 2015 hit, and that was a tough year too at first. But then we continued working hard, and over time we started to see things change. We started to see the tide turning. And then 2016 happened, and that was an amazing year. We signed a contract to train our hundreds of young African leaders every year. Our programs were growing. Our business became financially sustainable. So we got invitations to do TED Talks and speak at the White House. And we started to, get to, uh, started to win education awards. And it felt like things had never been better. In the meantime, we had expanded to Brazil and where we had really taken off. And now here we are in India. But none of that would have happened if we had left Kenya in May of 2014. If we had said at that time that this is too dangerous, we need to leave, none of this would have happened. So that morning when I got that wake up call from our office assistant at 7 a.m. on a Friday morning, it was a wake up call in two ways. Firstly, it actually woke me up. And uh, secondly, it was a wake up call because it helped me see that when you stand up for your values, when you do the things you believe in, that will eventually lead to success. Thank you.